Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Great. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, today, um, uh, Maria Kif Kifarova is going to be giving uh, a talk on uh, her work. And uh, Marika, uh, Maria is uh, doing her master's degree currently at the Comenius University uh, in Slovakia, and in particular, doing research at the Research Center for Quantum uh, Information at the Slovak Academy of Science. And uh, much of her work has been uh, supervised by Daniel Nagai. Uh, and uh, uh, Maria has worked for the previous two summers at the Institute for Quantum Computing in uh, Waterloo. And today she's going to be talking about some work that I'm really excited about on showing um, quantum speed up by quantum annealing. Thank you very much. Okay. So thank you, Nathan, for introduction and also thanks for having me here. I will tell you something about my recent work with Rolando Solma and also my supervisor, Daniel Nagai, uh, when we were back in Slovakia. And we asked ourselves. Okay, so we ask us uh, this question. So can we get an exponential speed up with the uh, adiabatic computation? And we know that there is an equivalence between adiabatic model, quantum computation and the uh, circuit model. But uh, could we do it using some very natural algorithm with a sparse, simple Hamiltonian? And in this talk, I will tell you that the answer is yes uh, for the given prog problem called glue that I will talk about. This problem was solved, previ solved previously with quantum walks due to Andrew Charles and others. But we use new adiabatic uh, quantum computation approach. So I will talk then about quantum adiabatic quantum computation. And finally, I will present the new algorithms which we made. So let's start with glue trees. We have two bin binary trees which are glued together with a random cycle. We could glue it together just by connecting the leaves from trees. But when we do it this way, all vertices will have degree three, except for these two guys, the entrance and the exit, which are somehow special this way. So this. And our goal is basically to go through this labyrinth starting at entrance and go to the exit point. Since the depth of one tree is some n, then the, we have exponential number of, of vertices here, and the whole adjacent symmetries would be exponential. So that's why the problem is given as an oracle problem. So we start with the key for the entrance vertex and the, the oracle uh, and the oracle when we uh, input the label of a given vertex it will give us uh, labels of the neighboring vertex vertices three if we are somewhere in the middle of trees or two if the vertices if the uh, vertex was entrance of or exit. And also we, can, we could possibly try to guess these labels, but the labels can be strong, larger strings, so it's exponentially unlikely to try a good uh, vertex, to try a good label and succeed. And our goal is to find the exit key, exit, exit la label to the exit vertex. So we start here and we ask Oracle which way we want to go and we need to find this vertex at the opposite part of growth trees. So the most, the easiest thing we could possibly do it would be to try some random walks. And when we start from entrance, uh, everything is easy until we get to the other trees. So here it doesn't matter where we go, every time we go to the right direction. But when we cross the middle point, we have every time bigger chance to go back than to continue the, uh, the 
the, to the right way. So after several steps, we will start returning and uh, it would take us exponentially show number of steps to reach the exit vertex just with random walk. Okay, but <coughs> we could use also memory and try to put a thread through our labyrinth or color vertices that we already know. But Andrew Charles and other people show that this is not possible. So even if we allow <coughs> ourselves memory, no classical algorithm could succeed and travels the glue trees in lesser than exponential number of steps. Did you say the bipartite graph in the middle is a single cycle? Uh, it doesn't have to be. It's randomly glued somehow. It's just a random yeah. degree two bipartite graph. Uh, yeah. Regular bipartite graph. Okay, yeah, it's randomly glued from this part to this part so that all, uh, all Degrees to degrees will be free. Degrees to, but it, it yeah. It, well, it doesn't have to be circle necessarily. But okay, okay. So what about quantum case? Could we go somehow efficiently from here to here? And uh, we will see. Then the answer is yes. But first, we need to. Uh, defined in the problem in quantum setting. So we start in the end sta entrance state and we have access for these three oracles. First one is the adjacency matrix of the glue trees which will serve as our Hamiltonian and also we have projectors on entrance which is easy because we already know the state and projector on the exit which is other state we of degree to other than the ex uh, entrance and the goal is to prepare exit state eventually so we need to uh, end in a state which will be overlapped um, with the exit state so then when we measure it we could get exit state with high probability and this way we could prepare it probabilistically and the way how we can traverse glue trees is using quantum walks, which are uh, in some sense quantum analog of continuous time uh, ra random walks or diffusion. So continuous time quantum walks on graphs are defined by graph. Its uh, vertices are uh, our states and the edges give possible connections between states. So the adjacency matrix is our Hamiltonian and the dynamics of quantum walks is a unitary one. So the Hamiltonian will be adjacency matrix of this graph or any graph we want to use and then unitary evolution uh, is given by Schrodinger equation where the exp exponential of the matrix is defined as Taylor series, but the most natural way how to implement it would be to, via, will be to go to eigenbasis and then exponentiate the matrix trivially. Okay, and continuous time quantum box has been studied a long, long in the last 10 years, let's say 15. And the two things which are in interesting here is how they evolve and spread. This is one picture where we started here in the middle and uh, we let the quantum walk evolve on a line. And this is how it looked for quite short time and it spread like this when the times was longer and longer. So you can see that the distribution, probability distribution, which can be made from the unitary evolution is essentially different than, in, than for random walks. We don't have uh, binomial distributions here, but these strong peaks uh, at both ends. And also they spread faster than random walks. Or, uh, <sighs> this property was used for algorithms and 
for going through NAND trees and decision trees. And also uh, Andrew Childs and others showed that the uh, quantum walks are universal for computation. This is a new result, which is basically an exponential improvement over the older paper. Uh, so uh, to solve uh, uh, traversing through glue trees using quantum walk, we, st we first uh, we don't use stage as single vertices from this graph, graph but uh, columns as, as are plotted here, and we define this column subspace, which can be shown that it's invariant under action of Hamiltonian, which is adjacency matrix of the whole graph. So when we are in one column, let's say this one, and we apply the Hamiltonian, we will end up in these two neighboring columns uh, as expected. So we can project the whole graph on a line like this. And we don't have exponential many states as before, but only linear. But the, it, uh, to finish it, the, we also need to find the weight of the edges because uh, the, and the, this is how the line uh, finally looks like. So the, uh, so all edges have weights square root of 2, except for the middle one. Um, this comes from normalization of columns and except calculation, which is pretty straightforward, but quite boring. So it's easy to see that all these, all edges in this part will be equivalent, and only this edge can be somehow special. And that's exactly what we see here. This is the uh, adjacency matrix of the line. It's free diagonal. Uh, and the, this is the interesting part in the middle. So we can do unitary evolution in, in this Hamiltonian. And it was shown that uh, the, the, this approach requires only polynomial number of steps to reach uh, the exit vertex with some uh, 1 over n probability. But then we wanted to apply this, uh, wanted to solve this problem with uh, adiabatic, uh, with an adiabatic algorithm, because as I mentioned, glue trees are hard for classical computation, but uh, it, uh, they were solved using quantum walks in quantum setting. So they, they are an interesting example of a distinction between quantum and classical algorithms. So firstly, time dependent Hamiltonians. Uh, we, can, we can again solve Schrodinger equation, but unlike in the common setting here, the Hamiltonian also depends on time. So we can't just exponentiate it directly, but we would need to slice the time into many small pieces. And in each small, each step, we can evolve with Hamiltonian, which doesn't depend on time anymore, just for short time, uh, update our state and update our Hamiltonian and evolve it again. So uh, this sort of evolution is quite complicated, but we can again define eigenstates, but they will be different for any time. So for uh, for time, but for any time t, we can, there is an eigenbasis which is complete and orthogonal. Mm, and moreover, the, uh, we will use this notation when we use relative time instead of, of time, and the s relative time parameter goes from 0 to 1. 
So although time dependent, uh, the evolution with time dependent Hamiltonians is uh, is complicated, there are two uh, two easy regimes. The first one is called diabetic, when the total evolution time is very short. So we have initial Hamiltonian, and very fastly we will change it to to final Hamiltonian. So for example, we have spin in magnetic field, and we turn the magnetic field to opposite direction or somehow else. So in this case, since the time is so short, the wave function and the state doesn't change almost at all. So if we were in an eigenstate of the initial Hamiltonian, we will be at the same state after the evolution, but it probably won't be an eigenstate of the final Hamiltonian anymore. So we will end up in some superposition of eigenstates of the final Hamiltonian. The complete opposite is adiabatic regime, when we change the Hamiltonian very, very slowly. And when we change it infinitesimally small, then the system remains in its eigenstate. Or when we change it just <coughs> slow enough, we will be close to the eigenstate or, or in our setting to the ground state. <coughs> and if the uh, change of the Hamiltonian is smooth enough and uh, it can be normalized properly, then we can show that the time needed to reach the adiabatic regime squares as 1 over the minimal gap between the ground state and the first excited state. Okay, and okay, so this idea can be used in quantum computation. We start with a Hamiltonian, which can be easily prepared in a lab and in, and in the ground state of it. Then we change the Hamiltonian slowly to go to the final Hamiltonian. And if the change is slow enough compared to the minimal gap, we will end up in the ground state of the final Hamiltonian, which is somehow interesting for our computation. And this way of computing is universal as Dorit Aharonov showed. Okay, so uh, how can we use adiabatic uh, time evolution to solve our glue trees? The first thing we can uh, think about would be to start in enter in the entrance and uh, change the Hamiltonian from projector to the entrance to the projector of the exit. So firstly, we project only on the enter and then we project on the exit and the uh, whole evolution is linear, let's say. So this simple uh, approach doesn't work because in the middle we encounter an exponentially small gap. Another idea, which is pretty straightforward, is to start again in the entrance and evolve to the ground state of adjacent symmetrics of the trees. But here we won't have any problems with small gaps, but the ground state of adjacent symmetrics isn't the ground state of, uh, isn't the exit state, even more it has only exponentially small overlap with it. But we can combine these two approaches. So we take the projectors of enter, enter and exit and change them linearly as in the first shot attempt, but we add the adjacent symmetrics in the middle to help us overcome the, uh, the problematic region. And Isn't alpha plus beta equals one? Uh, no, why? Uh, we have some, some uh, weights on this part and this part, and the ratio here is important. So if, for example, we set, set alpha to, to zero, then we have the first attempt, which doesn't work, which we have only alpha, then it doesn't work again, as we saw previously. But maybe if we have both parts here, 
with some weight, then we can make it work. And we will see, and now we see how the spectra differ for different values of alpha and beta. So this part will be always one because we are interested only in ratio and we changed wages on projectors. So we, when we had only, only the adjacency matrix, then we have plots, plot like this, which looks nice. There are not exponentially small gaps, but it doesn't have the desired ground state or practically it doesn't do anything interesting at all. And when we start adding, adding projectors, then we can see the distinction between excited states and the ground state, where here the ground state will be the projector on the entrance and here on the exit. But there are some complicated parts here, here. And also when we make the projectors on, uh, on entrance and edges even stronger, uh, we get a complicated region also here. So if we, we turn out the, the adjacency matrix in the middle completely, we would get cross, almost crossing an exponentially small gap, as I told you before. Okay, but it's still, it's still not clear from plots of spectra. So here are the uh, corresponding gaps with the logarithmical scan of the y-axis. So this is the case only with adjacent symmetrics. All nice, but doesn't work. Uh, when we add projectors, we see two exponentially small gaps at the edges and these, well, strong gaps at the edges and something which looks more optimistic in the middle. And when we, mm, when we make uh, weights on edges even stronger, then we have, uh, sorry, we have uh, more, uh, more gaps in the middle. So from these pictures, it might seem that uh, every time we do something interesting, we will have these nasty gaps here. But in, for this picture, it still looks quite optimistic because uh, these two gaps are symmetric. And that's what we are going to use. So uh, we allowed us to differ from the standard adiabatic scheme and jump here. When we can go slow enough through this gap, we instead of, uh, we decide to jump and go on the first excited state in this region. And since it's all symmetric, in this part we are supposed to jump back. So that was our idea. Again, we start in a ground state and we want to go be on the ground state up to this point with the exponential gap, then jump to the first excited state. Here we need to go slowly enough because we don't want to propagate more to higher excited states. And if all is symmetric at the second gap, we should jump again back to the ground state and end in a ground state. What's the probability of not jumping the second gap? Uh, this one? Okay, this one. Uh, these two gaps are, are the same. The first one you don't care about. If you don't take the jump, it's fine. You're still in the ground state. Everything will still work. Oh, uh, here? Yeah, it doesn't matter yeah. whether you take that gap. Take, take, take the, any of those lines will still lead you to the same place. Uh, no, here we, we, we need to jump. Why? Because the, the gap is very small. And we know that if... Uh, uh, if we go uh, faster yeah. than one over the gap squared, we will jump. So what? And we can't go slow enough to stay here. So instead we say, okay, we don't care. And we jump here. And uh, if we go with the same rate here, we will jump again to the ground state. 
that's and not obvious that it will jump to the ground state. So I'm asking the probability okay. that it will jump to the Dave, ground Dave, state. Dave, she's in a regime mm -hmm. where yeah. it's very likely that you jump. Right. Yeah. And now she wants it to jump because if it's likely that she'll jump on the second time, then if you don't jump on the first time, it's not as likely then the time. you go the wrong way at the second time. It's mm -hmm. like two wrongs make yeah. a right. The, the yeah. other thing to note, Dave, is yeah. if you take a look at the blue curve down yeah. there, you'll notice that the brown curve actually is very smooth approaching the blue curve yep. over there. So what actually happens at that crossing is that that, that uh, leads to an extremely high probability of those transitions happening because right. the, because of the... No, I, I understand that. And I'm saying even if you didn't take it, it wouldn't matter. That no, that's point. what I'm saying. It would matter because, because it affects the one later. Because yeah. you're probably yeah, because you're probably then going to go the wrong way. You need to jump. You need I'll to, talk to you later about You need okay. to jump up and you need to jump down. Yeah. I understand the desirability, I understand why the first one matters and the second one. The second one, I get why it matters, I don't understand the first one, so someone will explain the math later. Thanks. Okay. Yes, <laughs> Okay, so first we needed to analyze the whole spectrum analytically. So because I said, okay, this looks exponential and this looks not so bad, so it will probably polynomial, but we need to know for sure. And uh, that's why we try to compute spectrum of the of the adjacent symmetrics. It's quite similar as the one from from glue trees, but we got these two self loops at the entrance and the exit vertex, which some weights which come from the weights between projectors and the uh, adjacent symmetrics of the glue trees and also they will be different in different times. So here we use the trick with plane wave ansatz because in this region it looks mostly as a line. It doesn't matter if we are in this vertex or the next vertex, our neighbors are still the same and uh, we know that in cases like this plane wave and says of this form uh, should work and okay. and uh, we get an eigenvalue of this form. Mm. So we applied answers like this or like this in these two parts and we with uh, and some linear allowed linear combinations of that to satisfy conditions also on the ends and in the middle. And solving a couple of equations, we end up with an equation for P, which is, was transcendental, but we were still able so, to solve it analytically when N went to uh, in the limit of large N. And from this, we computed the gaps exactly. So this is how the spectrum uh, looks like when we take everything into account. So firstly, here is the first uh, gap, exponential, but yeah, here the depth of trees isn't that large, so we can see that we don't have crossings here, but the gap in this region uh, turns out to be exponential and scales like this. The second gap is the same as we saw, f saw from plots and also from symmetry of the adjacent symmetrics. And the uh, plot in, and the uh, gap in the middle between the uh, first excited state and the second excited state squares only as one over n cube, so it's polynomial. Okay, so therefore if uh, our rate will be somewhere between these uh, between these two limitations. When we go this way, uh, we will jump to the first excited state because as Nathan said, the, it approach uh, here the connection is smooth as n increases. Here we don't want to jump and in this part we will return again to the ground state. And uh, we have analytical results that the behavior is as I mentioned, but I will show only the one from, mm, from our numerics. So we started 
in the ground state and until we reach the this point we were still in the ground state here we went fast enough so the we jumped almost 100 percent here and in the middle region we lost some of population on the first excited state but we had still enough to reach the reach the second jump place and return to the ground state still with very high probability so this is how it all worked like we solved this problem for uh, glue trace which is known to be exponentially hard for any classical uh, com computers uh, then we apply the ideas from quantum walks from uh, older papers and, and the adiabatic quantum computation but we we didn't go through the classical to the through the common adiabatic scheme and we didn't take the ground state all the time but we jumped we started in the ground state then jumped to the first excited state and jumped back so this way we came up with a new algorithm which uh, in which we had exponential gaps but we didn't mind because of the symmetry with this approach we gain exponential speed up against classical algorithms and we, we did this with a spar Hamiltonian which is even more stochastic although we didn't follow the, the any link regime so we didn't learn more about the possibilities of stochastic Hamiltonians in quantum in quantum annealing and also uh, there is the question if we could use possibly jumps for some other problems and to gain advantage over the way that people thought before about a diabetic computation so yeah that's all and thank you for your attention <laughs>
it's a Heisenberg factor. So, uh, I mean, wouldn't that be enough? If, if, if the, the problem is generating is figuring out what that function is, but if you had a function, you could replace alpha, beta, and all that other stuff mm -hmm. with these. Okay. The with, this, with this continuous or yeah, it can turn not necessarily out. continuous, but this function that tells you how fast to go. But if you yeah, if you if, if you think it, about it, the best the best that you could end up uh, getting out of this these sorts of strategies, say you plot in the Grover search, will get you you know a polynomial like a quadratic speed up at, at best. And uh, with in this case, the algorithm isn't particularly a practical one. So the key point is just showing the exponential speed up. So you know I, I think yeah. these strategies could work, but it's not clear that for the, the purposes here it's necessary. This proved the point. This that just proved the, the point. That's and that's the whole that's the whole point of this algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting. Do you really need a perfect symmetry, or just do you just need two level crossings? I think you need two level crossings. And you know, and can you steer yourself through the through the the, the state diagram effectively they, in an appropriate way? How much control can you really have at those crossings? I, I, I suspected this question would come up uh, uh, earlier, and I think that that that's one of the, the issues with this work that hasn't been addressed. Uh, maybe correct me if I'm wrong about that. About you know the issues about the um, um, sensitivity to small deviations okay. in the derivatives near the crossing or avoiding crossing. Yeah, I don't know, but I would suspect that even small deviation can break the symmetries here. But if you if you can control like maybe by coupling to a heat bath or something, if you can control where you come out. At the, when you when you go past the crossing, you don't need symmetry at that point. If you can effectively steer your approximation, it's like your a controlled diabetic evolution. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Okay. But we still need at least two gaps when we right. are one yeah, yeah. Have, um, get one gap in the middle. We can use these tricks at, at all. least. At least an even number. Yeah. 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 Well, I guess we started in an excited state. That's right. You start, it depends on where you start. It yeah. depends on how easy it is to prepare. I mean, I yeah. wouldn't say necessarily you want know, to start, in the, start with the answer. You know, don't start at the beginning. Start somewhere else. Be sure to start the starters. Okay.